The idea for this video came from a discussion with a subscriber. He mentioned he had a Browning BAR rifle, which would fire in the summer, but not in very cold temperatures of negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit. He told me that he believed the problem was that the rifle had tight tolerances, and that the cold had caused the firing pin to shrink just enough to cause problems. He also told me a few more important things. The first, that he only uses Magnum primers in very cold weather because other rifle primers were unreliable. Magnum primers simply have more priming compound, which is more forgiving for igniting power in adverse conditions. The second thing he told me was that the gunsmith found his firing pin in the BAR to be within spec. The third was that the primers on the BAR were being dimpled, but not struck with enough force. He also determined that lubricant in the firing pin channel was not causing this problem. I initially doubted that tolerances were the problem considering how little steel shrinks in the cold, but after reading a forum post about a very similar problem with the CZ rifle, I understood that this subscriber was right about tolerances being the problem. This forum post mentioned that the problems with light primer strikes in the cold were solved by reducing the diameter of the firing pin. However, it's not the length of the firing pin that's the problem because it shrunk a little in cold weather. It's that the bolt and the firing pin have shrunk to different degrees. The smaller a piece of steel is, the less it shrinks in extreme cold, so the diameter of the firing pin is very small, and that means it shrunk less than the surrounding bolt causing friction which slowed the firing pin. Likewise, I believe this is not a problem of tight tolerances, but of loose tolerances. High tolerance refers to how perfectly machined parts are, and how little dimensional variation is allowed. If two parts are absolutely perfectly machined, they have tight tolerances. If two parts are installed in a machine, and they are made too large, and they don't meet the specifications, and this causes an unacceptable amount of friction, this is still a problem of loose tolerances despite the space between the parts being very little. However, if someone happens to be experiencing the same problem, but finds that the firing pin is not the cause, there could be alternate answers. The first being that the cold made the action somewhat sluggish. The newer Browning BARs have an adjustable gas system, and if this gas system isn't tuned right, the rifle can fail to cycle right only in cold weather. If the force behind the action is not enough to cycle the round into battery all the way, the firing pin will hit somewhat off-center, and only leave a dent because the full force isn't being used. Another possible answer is cold affecting the springs. Spring steel gets less springy and more stiff in very cold temperatures, so if you have a worn hammer spring to begin with, this can exacerbate the problem with a lack of hammer force in extreme cold. There is a tendency among many people to attribute any problems with unreliability as being caused by tolerances that are too tight. This is kind of an oversimplification that is very easy to make if you don't know exactly what is wrong with the gun. The old belief that M16s or AR-15s do not work well in muddy or humid conditions in Vietnam because of tight tolerances is provably wrong. Its direct impingement system is not really a problem either. The problem with the M16 not working in Vietnam was directly due to the fact that the chamber was not chrome-plated. If the army didn't issue you any cleaning tools for the chamber, and you are constantly in a very humid environment, this inevitably leads to corrosion and rust in the chamber. This corrosion increases the effort needed to extract the empty case and will lead to failures to extract. This will lead to people dying in firefights because their guns jammed and became worthless. These problems simply didn't happen anymore once the soldiers were issued rifles that had the necessary chrome plating. Browning BARs can actually have problems with corrosion as well, because the older 70s models had no chrome plating on the inside of the gas cylinder. The piston itself had plating, but that wouldn't stop the cylinder from rusting and seizing up if it wasn't cleaned. This was solved on the later models because they started chroming the gas cylinders as well. It's common knowledge that it's difficult to get magazine releases and safeties free once ICE has covered them. There are obvious exceptions to this though, like with AK pattern rifles. AKs have a much larger safety slash dust cover that allows superior leverage. Likewise, the mag release is basically a lever holding the mag in place by spring tension. 
so it's not hard to get the release unstuck by just using force. Regardless of this, if you have significant snow and ice causing your rifle to jam, that's not the fault of the rifle, that's a problem with the operator. You are responsible for ensuring your weapons work when you need them most, which means that you have to take your rifle apart and make sure it gets dry after getting wet. Or in the case if you're taking a cold rifle into a warm room, this will cause condensation, which will turn quickly into ice if you go back outside. So make sure to dry off the condensation before you go back out into the cold. However, some designs will be more tolerant to keeping out debris and preventing things like ice from freezing up parts. For example, Revolvers have exposed cylinders and many have exposed hammers. This means they are more vulnerable to debris and snow causing reliability problems, as Alan's video here demonstrates. Likewise, pistols with exposed hammers will be more vulnerable to debris because of the exposed firing pin channel. In Grand Thumb's freezing handgun tests, the Beretta M9, for example, had ice in the firing pin channel, and no matter how many times the hammer was dropped, it was not firing. I would also like to mention that we should be careful the amount of value we are giving to the results of these tests because every gun is only a sample size of one, and the tests aren't repeated to see if the results stay the same. Going back to cold weather affecting primers, I want to mention a forum post about Nobel Sport 686 shotgun primers not working in relatively mild temperatures of roughly 35 degrees. They were simply not igniting the powder properly at this temperature when they had done fine in warmer temperatures, so the only variable that seems to have changed here was the temperature. This person also mentioned that the W209, Federal 209A, and Rio G600 primers all worked well in cold temperatures. Likewise, we have two other people that have the same experience of Nobel Sport primers not working right in cold conditions. Another forum post complained of Cheddite shotgun primers not working well in mild temperatures of 45 degrees. In this case, I believe this person had just a few bad primers, as another forum post described that the Cheddites were working well even at negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Most people rightly assume that when a gun isn't firing in cold temperatures, it's either because the gun is dirty or that the lubricant is the problem. However, neither dirt nor gelled lubricant can cause repeated hang fires like this person mentions. So after this person noticed he had a problem with the shotgun hang firing, he thoroughly cleaned it with gun scrubber and apparently did not lubricate it. However, the problem still happened again the next day. The gun misfired and showed a light dent on the primer this time. I believe the major part of this problem is that the primers are struggling to work right in the cold. That would explain the hang fires, but not the light strike. So it may be that the hammer spring was affected by the cold as well, and this reduced its strength. I do not believe it to be a major firing pin or tolerance issue in my opinion, because that would have caused much more frequent problems instead of the occasional problems as he describes. Likewise, Alan from the YouTube channel Guns, Gears, and Outdoors Alaska had light primer strikes with a Ruger Mark IV pistol. He made the reasonable assumption that it was probably the lubricant he was using that was causing this problem. However, he used an excessive amount of that same lubricant on an AR-15, and it worked fine in extreme cold. This would suggest that the lubricant was probably not the problem. I can't tell for sure what's going on here, but a good place to start would be by giving it a good cleaning. Another person who had problems in the cold with his Ruger Mark IV determined that the problem was that it just needed to be cleaned. Another person noticed he had problems only in cold weather with his 300 blackout rifle. It was failing to fire due to excessive lubricant which had become thicker and springs that were weak. Both problems were exacerbated by mild cold weather in the upper 30s. In comparison, if you have a handgun that is getting progressively more light strikes the longer it's in the cold, that's a sign the lubricant is causing the problem. Specifically in the case of an XDM mentioned here, it had lubricant that had made its way into the striker channel, which had become thicker due to the cold, and this was causing the light strikes. Brass Fetcher did some negative 65 degree reliability testing on a 1911 with various lubricants. His chart on the left shows the reliability of the rounds fired per each lubricant. What I believe is more important though is the chart on the right, 
This shows the increase of time that it took for the slide to cycle in extreme cold. The thicker the lubricant gets in cold, the slower the slide travels, and the more likely the malfunctions are going to happen. High viscosity in cold temperature predicts high reliability in cold temperature. In short, REM oil is very good even in extreme cold. One of the things I always heard about why revolvers have an advantage in the case of misfire is because all you have to do is pull the trigger again instead of having to rack a slide. This advantage is not very large in my opinion. This is because many police and self-defense shootings in normal conditions have relatively low amount of rounds fired. On top of that, we have available reliable weapons and ammunition. On top of that, in 1972, there was a survey given to hundreds of law enforcement agencies. By looking at that survey, we can see the amount of cylinder and timing related problems. Then we can compare that to the number of ammunition and misfire related problems reported by departments. The results are that cylinder and timing related problems are nearly double that of ammunition and misfire related problems. So concerns about misfiring is vastly overblown in comparison to cylinder problems which were far more common and far more dangerous. Solving misfire problems is a relatively easy thing. Most of the time it's either the ammunition in the itself that's the problem or a weak hammer spring. If it is in fact the ammunition, that's an easy fix. As always, the most important aspect of good self-defense ammunition is reliability. Likewise, in the event of a misfire, the idea that a single action pistol is inherently better than something like a striker fire because you can cock the hammer and strike the primer again is fundamentally flawed in my opinion. If this was just a one-off occurrence, why would you bother to strike the problem round again if you can just eject it and use what in all likelihood is a perfectly good new round underneath it? What makes you think that you can bet your life on the problem round firing on the second try if you apply the same amount of force on the primer again? If there was something seriously wrong with either the primer or the hammer spring, you may require multiple strikes to set off the round. By the way, I have taken 22 ammunition that did not fire, ejected it, put it back in the chamber, and tried to fire it again. It did not fire, so I didn't see any point in trying to strike it more times if it hadn't already gone off. In this video, Roger demonstrates that revolvers with weak action springs will fire more reliably in single action than double action. The reason why this happens is because the hammer is pulled back farther in single action, which results in more force hitting the primer. Also, harder primers will obviously be less reliable with a weak hammer spring and double action fire. The reason why the hammer doesn't go as far back in double action is fairly obvious. It would result in an even heavier double action trigger pull, and another reason would be that it's not necessary if the springs are actually in good condition. All of this is true for double action slash single action semi-autos as far as I'm aware. So in the situation where debris is slowing down the hammer or hammer spring is weakened, one would have to admit that the single action design is better. If we were to compare single action to striker fired with both weakened springs, they would be roughly equal. However, a single action pistol with an exposed hammer and firing pin channel would be more vulnerable to dirt and debris than a striker fire pistol with basically no exposed important parts. But we should ask, does double action versus single action versus striker really matter that much even in very cold temperatures where springs are weakened? Only somewhat in my opinion. This is because a spring that's strong enough to begin with should work even in extreme conditions. Personally, I think it's a good idea to avoid using low power springs or titanium firing pins in cold temperatures, especially if your life depends on that firearm working right. Also, this video demonstrates that lower powered steel cased ammunition doesn't work as well as brass does in very cold conditions. They also use the suppressor to demonstrate that the back pressure from the suppressor was enough to make the rifle run reliably even with a lower powered steel case. So in conclusion, many things can cause reliability problems in extreme cold. If you have any problems, the first thing you should do is completely clean out that gun and dry it, and then shoot it again in the cold. That would probably solve most of the problems people have, but if it doesn't, it will at least start to rule out some of the possible causes. 
Finally, people who have seen Grand Thumb's freezing tests will know that you shouldn't assume that a lever action or a pump action will work well when icy just because they're manually operated. Such weapons require considerable force to work in such conditions, while a semi-auto can be easier to use because it's not relying on brute strength to operate. That said, there's no telling what will happen when your rifle or shotgun gets frozen. It may be rendered totally useless regardless of its design.